Okay, so welcome everyone for our um, weekly seminar series um, jointly uh, organized by the Department of Anthropology and Sociology at SOAS and the Center for Migration and Diaspora Studies. Um, I am a professor at the Anthropology Department and I'm also the chair of the center, so I'm hosting the seminars uh, in this capacity. I am extremely happy to host um, this talk tonight by Dr. Miriam Urach, who is a reader at the University of Westminster. Um, her PhD, which was obtained at the University of Amsterdam, um, contributed to an understanding of the significance of uh, techno-social evolutions by analyzing how a new technology coincided with the outbreak of a mass uprising in Palestine. That was during the second Intifada between 2000 and 2005. She then focused on the political role of new internet developments, such as blogging and social networking for grassroots activism um, in Lebanon, in Palestine, when she held a postdoctoral position at the Oxford Internet Institute until 2011. She then went on to earn a Leverhulme Early Career grant uh, where Miriam set up a critical research project in which she related theory with online analysis through a focus on the complex uh, relationships and dynamics um, across um, the Arab world. In this light, um, Miriam um, continued by researching and writing extensively about the paradoxical context of on online revolution and cyber imperialism across a variety of contexts in um, the Middle East, uh, including Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, and Morocco. Um, Miriam theorizes how the contradictions of capitalism shape the modes and meanings of resistance in the era of revolution and digital transformations. Her work is published in um, several books and uh, peer-reviewed journals. Um, and it, they, it, the, her publications include her own monograph titled Palestine Online, which was published in 2011. And we're very much looking forward to see her new publications, which include a book on cyber imperialism to be out in 2021, and a monograph about the revolutionary dynamics of protest in Morocco. I'm particularly happy to host Miriam because we have a long history. Not only we were born on the same day, but um, Miriam is a Moroccan Dutch anthropologist who, as I just mentioned, studied Palestine during her PhD times and continued to focus on Palestine in, in, in the, her recent research. Um, and we swapped because I am a Palestinian Italian and for my PhD, I worked in Morocco. So for a long time, we were um, just laughing about this swapping of um, um, insider outsider roles within across within and across our communities. Um, Miriam, we are very happy to host your talk, where, which uh, draws from a very recent article you published on race and class, where you um, analyze the concept of or critically engage with the concept of white privilege, as you define it as a concept that takes um, or that has become a shortcut in the analysis and mobilization of anti-racist uh, movements. And you do so by um, critically engaging with the legacy of uh, radical black thinkers and activists from Dubois to Sivanandan to Shakur and Angela Davis. And you very interestingly um, take us on um, an analysis or a, an engagement with the concept of radical kinship as an alternative. Um, concept to um, recenter internationalism as a way to recreate a dynamic that is anti-racist, anti-capitalist and intersectional. So we are very happy to uh, and very much looking forward to your talk tonight, which uh, draws upon this very important um, set of debates and ideas. And then, uh, as Kim said, we will be opening um, the conversation to, um, uh, to the floor. Uh, but at the Without further ado, Miriam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ruba, and thank you for uh, reminding me of our uh, opposite trajectories. Uh, you researching Moroccans, me researching Palestinians. It's such a nice um, coincidence. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I think this is an important topic and it's ongoing, and especially as we've seen the debates also emerging to much higher levels since the summer, since the 
fantastic emergence of uh, protest movements um, around Black Lives Matter. Um, you've uh, invited me particularly also with regards to the uh, publication in recent class. So what I will do is shed some light on the background and <laughs> you can hear the ambulance and uh, police are already coming for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I will first try to uh, position the debate uh, with regards to the article in race and class and then obviously throughout uh, this will touch on general discussions and debates around racism and anti-racism. So in essence the article uh, I wrote uh, in sort of stands on uh, two schisms uh, so I kind of want to reflect wanted to reflect on two schisms that I observed that were emerging, uh, particularly in social movements and activist milieus uh, that I am partly also uh, involved with. So it's more uh, public intellectual engagement than it is a scholarly academic uh, engagement. But obviously the discussion about race and racism is also very much part of an academic uh, discourse uh, and debate. So there will be uh, overlapping concerns and uh, debates. So firstly, what are these two schisms? So on the one hand, I identified that um, I uh, saw and observed and read that class-based analysis were sometimes pit against uh, race-based analysis. And in that schism, I found that internationalism anti-imperialism and uh, capital in general was receding towards the background more and more in uh, analysis and discussions about racism and or functioned more as a kind of entourage a kind of sort of general um, labels and terminology but not part of the methodologies of how to resist so there were sometimes even debates that suggested a division of labor between white activists involving themselves uh, with anti-capitalism and black or people of color activists with anti-racism as if these two were not uh, related. So that was one schism. The other, the second one uh, that I found really important to think about was the questioning of solidarity politics. Um, this was joined sometimes uh, with the shift towards new political articulations uh, that represented a subjective or skin colored based positions of people. And I found it really intriguing how the term NBPOC or non-Black people of color were emerging and how sometimes also um, terms like people of color or political blackness were being mocked in the process or even um, yeah, denied as being still relevant uh, terminologies. I also felt that this was related to kind of newer, it's not new, but at least in the recent years, relatively new for the movement, uh, selective usage and reading of what is called Afro-pessimism. So this selective or uh, new reading of Afro-pessimism was in a way related to the emergence of debates that were questioning solidarity politics and that were creating this divide between people of color. So I locate also the epistemological mediation of white privilege and whiteness uh, in this particular article as part of this process. And I found it very uh, fascinating to see how the logic of white privilege was being transported to a new a sort of division between people of color. So where you have the kind of uh, white versus black, what we saw emerging was brown versus black throughout using the same uh, references as were applied to white privilege. Although white privilege, white privilege has, uh, of course, uh, other influences in our anti-racist analysis and activist dynamics. I want to go into this uh, a bit deeper in the more problematic uh, uh, treatment, why it's actually not that useful. Um, that's what the article's title also was suggesting that white privilege in a way was also providing a shortcut analysis for a much more complicated and complex uh, 
um, discussion and um, understanding of racism. Uh, moreover, the overarching objective of my article and uh, consequent debates that emerged before and after the article is actually to think, uh, to think together about how to recover a more sort of radical universalist principle-based anti-racism. And I felt that thinking about how to recover an, a radical universal, universalist principle of anti-racism was actually also providing the solutions to overcome these very schisms that I identified. Finally, building on an understanding of radical kinship, I also wanted to propose potential uh, solutions in how we engage with each other as activists. It's a way to engage meaningfully with the different dispositions and predispositions we all carry and have and bring with us in the movement. I know that this is uh, very important also because I have personally experienced what it means to be disagreed with and that that sometimes can be uh, very um, yeah, discouraging and personalized. And I've in also uh, been tried to be open. Uh, I try to also make it uh, part of our discussion to share the upset and black backlash that it can produce when you engage in disagreements. And I felt it was very much like uh, what Sara Ahmed uh, uh, called that the one who raises a problem becomes the problem itself. And this is, I think, also important to bring into the debate and not shy away uh, from that. But first and foremost, in the article, I, I start and I, I wanted to locate uh, some of the developments I've been uh, raising uh, regarding the changing formations and modalities of anti-racism uh, in a general shift to the right. And of course, also as we've seen in recent years, very much with Bolsonaro, Trump, and all our uh, specific uh, experiences in Europe uh, and Brexit, that these shifts are also part of a shift to the right and the emergence of fascism across the globe. And in Europe, this is itself part of a broader history of the legitimation of racism. So the denial of racism has led to also frustrations about how to do anti-racism. And I think this is partly to do with the fact that there is a tendency to project racism as a problem that occurs in other countries. I mean, I'm speaking very much from my experience in the Netherlands, uh, but also I think partly in uh, Belgium, that there is this idea that racism belongs to the past and that it is located in the particular colonial uh, history, which is no longer relevant for present progressive or liberal culture. As I said, I am uh, talking from experience, uh, partly with my own um, participation in anti-racist politics in the Netherlands, but also I am located in the UK. And what I thought was interesting is to see some of the uh, tendencies that were emerging, you can say, in continental Europe, uh, like France, uh, I think the Scandinavian countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, but they were also slowly emerging in Britain. Britain, which was sort of seen as kind of the ideal, the, the, the much better uh, uh, example of how anti-racism uh, is done. So we see there connections emerging across countries where they were actually also not expected. But I, I wanted to say something about uh, Dutch society, which I think is going to be also informative uh, uh, for also the emergence uh, regarding racism and anti-racism in countries that have thought themselves to be superior or better, uh, such as in, in Britain compared to sort of the backward uh, 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 engagement with anti-racism in the Netherlands, because I think somehow the Netherlands do provide us <laughs> with potential insight into how things can go wrong elsewhere uh, too. So Dutch society as a whole, uh, for those uh, who uh, know a bit about Dutch society, this is not um, a surprise, but Dutch society as a whole congratulates itself uh, for its, uh, uh, although very artificial, but uh, idea of tolerance, the country uh, of tolerance. 
And this is what uh, some have called uh, a typical white innocence. And this is very important uh, in the work of Gloria Wecker, who has recently published a book called White Innocence, where this kind of Dutch tolerance and innocence is predicated on a very deep and uh, a silent uh, past about its own brutal, its own brutal colonialism and the role of slavery. Uh, this is recently changing. There's more debates about the colonial history and, and, and slavery in the Dutch context, but for a very, very long time, this has been erased and banned to the past. So add to this a supposed liberal, free-spirited culture, particularly uh, located post-Second World War, that is manufactured through the idea of uh, particular freedom a particular liberal progressive freedom that the Dutch claim. And that includes the claim to uh, uh, the right to say anything or insult anyone. So this is a, a very particular experience in the Dutch context that provides uh, uh, a hint to how racism is manifested. And as David Goldberg shows, a key device for sustaining this national self-image uh, of tolerant and free while still performing racism in quite uh, explicit way is the notion that anti-Semitism is the principal profile of racism. <laughs> That's the only legitimate principal form of racism that uh, the Dutch uh, or you can, I guess, insert now also the UK, considering the recent experiences with uh, anti-Semitism debates. So the only legitimate definition of racism is located in the Second World War and has to do with the horrible uh, treatment and complicity of uh, the um, extermination of the Jews uh, in our countries. So the result of this is that it has helped produce a negative conceptualization of Muslims in two ways. In particular, of course, if anti-Semitism is the only legitimate definition of racism, then Muslims are, whether it is through their Muslimness or through their pro-Palestinian and anti-Zionist positions, they become the central uh, accusation uh, ac accused for that anti-Semitism. So there's a double denial there. <laughs> On the one hand, the only legitimate form of anti of racism is anti-Semitism, but actually through Muslims, it also allows to um, to cleanse off the Dutch uh, uh, complicity in anti-Semitism and transform project this type of racism on Muslim migrants. Um, the same thing happens with a very staunch and very violent rejection of accepting that there is a particular anti-Black tradition of racism uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, and I think also very similar uh, uh, patterns we see in Belgium. And you see this, for instance, um, expressed through a very harsh rejection of critique that certain traditions and expressions uh, that are strongly anti-Black uh, have anything to do with racism. In the Netherlands, it is particularly projected on people protesting the figure of Black Pete during the animals in the class uh, celebrations, which is a kind of Black-faced figure that uh, has been defended as not being related to any form of racism. So these two, I think, uh, particular experiences with, on the one hand, the denial of racism by projecting uh, it on, uh, uh, by uh, uh, allowing only a one form of, anti of racism, meaning anti-Semitism to be acknowledged and then transporting that also to Muslims as being the perpetrators. And on the other hand, the denial and the refusal to engage with critics of anti-Black uh, traditions. So this is aggravated by the fact that racism is actually not a major social issue for the mainstream left. So imagine that all that I've said so far is what it is, bad enough, but what happens when this is also in the context where you have a mainstream left and even radical politics uh, that actually does not acknowledge racism or anti-racism as a core pillar of its struggle for justice. 
this is partly also, uh, of course, produced by the fact that in general, in the whole, you could say, global north, or uh, uh, at least in, in, in Europe, um, that the fact uh, that global south intellectuals have actually very little standing in the left canon. So if you look at the references in a lot of the writings and, and, and uh, textual traditions of the left, uh, the left canon, intellectuals of color are either ignored or creatively paraphrased as is thought. So this is a very important background. Uh, we cannot ignore uh, this uh, step into a more critical approach to how racism is manifested today and how we resist it. Now, before going into the content and context, I want to say also a few things about, as I mentioned, how we debate and engage and why that has become an important concern for me as well. I think we should start with acknowledging that there are there is never one standard approach or one singular agreement to how we do things. My piece in the Race and Class Journal was very clearly concerned with a left-wing variant of anti-racist politics and a variant of anti-racist analysis that is rooted in progressive values that believes in the universal equality for all working class peoples, whether black or racialized. And this is very different from other traditions, I guess, that I have a more liberal leaning uh, of anti-racism or a far more theoretical or academic uh, interpretation of anti-racism. My approach is very clearly positioned in a left-wing and partly Marxist analysis of anti-racism. And this includes also a belief and a reliance, in fact, on the possibility of transformational change. And my standpoint rejects essentialist predictions based on what we are or what we are condemned to be through our past experiences, general descriptions of privilege or limitations that are caused uh, and linked through our subjective, subjective positionalities. So I think that by not believing uh, that or by adhering to uh, a sort of fixed understanding of what we can and who we are, I do not see a point for me to engage in politics or in change, right? If we are doomed or predetermined by who we are, what is the point to include uh, radical politics in our lives that actually believes in transformative change. Um, so what I'm doing with regards to race and racialization is not about some kind of leisure just for the sake of it. It is not about virtue signaling or even about academic theoretical pontification just for the sake of academic theoretical pontification. The whole point is that I believe that we can transgress and transform. And that is why I sort of critique the idea of uh, a white privilege epistemology that concerns uh, our sort of uh, identity, uh, that concerns our understanding of who we are in a very fixed um, definition. But although I am very pessimistic in what these uh, alternative uh, new classless and subjective denominations can do. Uh, I don't believe in them and I want to reject them and that's why I intervened. I do remain optimistic in the possibility to overcome this. Uh, and I believe that we can create this change again. If not, I would not intervene or write these articles. So I believe that my approach is much more widely shared in the movements as well. We already see a lot of change since even this article has come out because the world has changed and people have seen and been confronted also with the challenges of capitalism and austerity and particularly in the recent uh, pandemic, uh, people have come to understand so much clearer that race and class are intertwined. So I think that there are certain trends and changes and challenges, but that the strength of activist movements 
is in community organizing and collective labor. And that the organized left has must manifest itself in what ideas and suggestions come to the service from these collective um, endeavors and uh, communities. Um, and that we also therefore must be very vigilant that those alternative views and analysis that come out from the collective activists, movements and communities are not going to be forgotten and erased. And why do I say this? I say this because I have seen in uh, the study and in my engagement with um, alternative readings and radical uh, uh, intellectual traditions uh, that I find very inspiring and that I've included in my own article, that these also have been erased in the meantime, that a lot of uh, ideas that have come out, for instance, from radical movements in the 60s and 70s, and how discussions about identity politics or privilege, etc., that have already been challenged in very inspiring radical ways, have actually been forgotten. And so I suggested in my article that what we need to do is recover those historical uh, legacies of radical thought. So in the spirit of uh, further disclaimers, I have to, of course, say in a seminar that is part of a university that expects some kind of scholarly engagement that has some kind of grounding in uh, objective or pragmatic uh, uh, positioning of the scholar that I'm clearly not neutral here. I really don't want to be uh, neutral either on this topic. So this talk is based very explicitly on the premise that we actually must recreate a very selective, dynamic, radical, anti-racist uh, legacy that starts and ends with the revolutionary kinships and fraternity, not so much from a moralist motive, but it's good and better to be nice to each other, but also from a very instinctive understanding that separate organizing and activist infighting, that through that we will never win anyway, because we are all separately too small, both numerical as well as our access to power. So that's a very strong premise. And I think that this is why I also opted for an outlet such as Race and Class. It's a very important scholarly journal, but it's a journal also that does not shy away from taking these very non-neutral position. So let me return to the schisms I mentioned at the beginning. I said just now that I think, especially since the summer and this global spread of protest, the first schism that I identified in my article, uh, the one that sees race spirit against class, I think is changing. And I think for the better, I think the financial crisis and the ramification in particular of COVID-19, together with the fascinating popularity among activist circles of what is termed racial capitalism as a concept and body of literature, has allowed a way to converse about race and class in very organic ways uh, that, um, are, uh, that were not the case a few years ago. So I think sometimes we also need to take stock of what we say and write in our publications and return to them and say, well, is that still the case? I'm very happy to say, for myself at least, I think that there is a very positive shift in that that schism is no longer as absolute and as strong as it was before. Um, I think also we see this, sh this shift to a much more radical and useful uh, interpretation uh, in activist circles through the emergence of what is called Marxist intersectionality, but also in theories that uh, we uh, have uh, come to see uh, growing uh, called a social reproduction theory. So this kind of progressive uh, or what me and my group of, of, of uh, uh, friends that are pre preparing an article called Insurgent Intersectionality actually shows that uh, there is uh, more interest and openness in censoring class relations and capital accumulations in our analysis. So that's a really interesting shift. Um, 
my adherence to such a material view, materialist view, as I also explained in the article, is not at all a matter of my preference. It's not about me personally preferring to have a materialist, materialist view. Um, but rather, I see it as a necessity that is enforced on me and us by capitalism. It does not grant us the choice to actually selectively pick and choose whether we're going to engage with class or capital, etc. It may sound strenuous, but we just cannot not think about taking into account uh, class and capital uh, in our strategies and in our tactics. At the same time, the power of language and discourse sometimes shows itself also in how we decode and encode. Uh, I think there is, uh, uh, it's a fact that when a lot of people uh, hear uh, class, uh, they interpret it uh, not in its radical potential uh, meaning as in undoing capital, but very much as, in, as I said in the beginning, as something that is inhibited in a white left approach to struggle. So I think that we need to also grasp these contradictions that at this, on the one hand, there are material realities that we cannot avoid, that we have to include in our strategies and tactics. And on the other hand, there are certain terms that have either lost or changed its potential meaning to be encoded in radical ways. So if class is not understood in what its radical purpose is, so the undoing of capital, then maybe a more analytically useful modality that we could engage with would be, for instance, exploitation or inequality. I was very much uh, inspired by a talk that Paul Giro gave the other day, where he centered the idea of inequality as a kind of common uh, linguistic tool to uh, allow us to deal with anti-racism and racialization in a more sort of radical progressive way. And this is where I also recognize very much the problem with white privilege as a term. It is a term more than any other terms that allows us to selectively pick and choose, to focus on certain dynamics and modalities that create this white privilege that have to do with uh, skin color uh, and far more than, for instance, uh, class and other power relations. So I really agree with Gilroy here where he says that it is actually a testimony also of our inability to find the language of humanity that is adequate to the task that is uh, meant to perform. That there is a poverty of imagination that is compounded also by anxiety and depression of the left at the moment and that we should try to find a way to avoid it. So I really agree with uh, Paul Guerrero here that there is a, a time to th rethink the kind of uniformly uh, um, uh, approach to the oppressed black peoples uh, victimized by the uniform power of whiteness. Um, we have to do a bit more thinking about what's actually going on here. Um, so, how do we then navigate uh, this very contradictory terrain? How do we formulate productive alternatives without alienating those we disagree with? How do we also navigate these contradictions without ignoring and erasing internal contradictions and oppressions that are also prevalent in our communities? Um, so I think this is a very important question because what I felt was that when you enter this debate, you quickly actually become part of a dichotomy. You either agree uh, with the fact that there is, for instance, um, racism that crosses all ethnic lines, or you disagree when you want to problematize that kind of thinking by linking it, for instance, to state power and capital. I think this has to do with the problem of engaging with terms and language and text. So when we refer to whiteness or white privilege or anti-blackness or any other uh, uh, terms that are uh, used, do we refer to it as a sort of contemporary pre prescribing contribution or is it a historical descriptive? 
sometimes those differences are not expressed clearly and then we risk reifying certain expectations of what people do or intend to do so when we talk for instance about anti-blackness and islam do we mean a historical uh, reading of uh, islamic law or communities or do we mean how muslim migrants today in amsterdam brussels or london engage, engage with uh, 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 other people of color um, is this reproducing knowledge about radical change for the academy or is it producing knowledge for radical change in activist movements that is another very important question what i see is that a lot of discussions in the academic milieu actually flow over into the activist milieus. This has partly to do with the fact that activism, whether it's anti-racism or any other type of activism, in the last 20 years have uh, located itself more and more on, in campus politics. So it has become part of student politics and therefore the proximity between uh, production of knowledge um, about uh, racism or radical change from the academy is very tightly connected to how activists interpret them. So I think it is very unfortunate when we see the definition of certain terms then change in the meantime while the world is not changing or changing for the worse. So I think it's very unfortunate that in a time of extra violent imperialism the anti-imperialist internationalist base of anti-racism was actually dissipating. I'm referring here to my own moment of sort of radical activist uh, transformation, namely the period of 9-11, where we have seen actually a raging imperial carnage, namely uh, the war on terror. This has unleashed further modalities of racism. And it's very, uh, interesting to see that has that that has emerged and happened at a time where racism and the definitions of racism and anti-racism were actually more and more being divorced from its radical historical legacy that always included anti-imperialism and internationalism so we see new forms and modalities of racism emerging sometimes islamophobia merges and morphs into anti-black racism, sometimes we see new forms of racism actually unseen also before and very contradictory with our ideas of white privilege if we think, for instance, of what Brexit has done with the racialization of Eastern Europeans that are not uh, visibly uh, recognized as belonging to uh, examples of uh, 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 communities that are also racialized. At the same time, I also think we need to think about how, for instance, the voter uh, traditions and, and trends in the last few years have also shown a shift whereby voting for racist parties and racist candidates is not anymore the side of white people. In Brexit, uh, it's quite painful to see that quite a number of Asian and Black communities have also voted for Brexit and the last voter uh, breakout of Trump have also seen a shift, uh, albeit small, but still interesting and important for us to pause why an increasing number of, for instance, uh, Black and Latino voters have moved to uh, Trump. So again, when I say this, I think one of the most important cautions is how we can discuss all of this without losing sight of the power of the state and capital. We need to not flatten our critiques and new interpretations and problematizations of dynamics of racism with, for instance, the white supremacist state. We need to always understand that there's a hierarchy and that we cannot explain away uh, white supremacy that is centered by the state with uh, people of color voting for, uh, for instance, right-wing parties. For this, I suggest also in the article that we need to have a cross-generational approach in our engagement with anti-racism. 
I am saying this because it's also, I think, a little bit sad when we realize that enormous production of knowledge and experience of people from previous generations in previous experiences of resistance uh, and social movements are actually completely absent in our current uh, uh, learning and rediscovering and sometimes even inventing the wheel uh, in the movement. So what I'm suggesting through several examples in the articles that, that people can read and uh, loads of references uh, to, to uh, uh, other articles about these, this, this black radical left-based anti-racism um, that is not part of the curriculum in contemporary anti-racist studies, but that have actually already encountered and provided uh, very important answers for the same questions I'm asking today. So I am worried that there is a kind of navel gazing that has emerged in the movements regarding anti-racism that kind of eclipses another horizon that was already in the making, albeit very short-lived uh, in the 60s and 70s, that actually that erasure or that absence forecloses, forecloses our prospect of unity and solidarity. So basically I'm saying we need to reconnect with these radical pasts and see what these other generations before us have already tried to do by uh, uh, in terms of overcoming these schisms and also in terms of building coalition politics that is not uh, uh, risking erasure of internal oppressions. Um, I think I want to use the last uh, few minutes to say a bit about this intergenerational participation and cross historical framing uh, that I find very, uh, yeah, unfortunate, uh, unfortunately uh, absent in our contemporary production of knowledge or even consumption uh, of knowledge. I think that what I found really interesting by going through some of the writings of activists and radicals from the past, that there was also very much an emphasis on how we do politics with each other. One of the examples I've discussed in, in my uh, article is the writings or the memoirs of Asata Shakur, where she actually, for different reasons, also because it's her experience also uh, depicts the contradictions within movements regarding uh, um, gender and, and class as well, right? We don't have ideal movements where none of these discussions were had. But what I really found very interesting in, in her contributions uh, that, again, are very absent in our contemporary libraries is how we deal with each other is sometimes as important with uh, what we are dealing uh, with. Um, like Angela Davis, uh, Asata Shakur was actually focusing on the point that our politics is much more about freedom than it is about, for instance, a blackness or uh, our identity. And I thought it was really important to go back to these sort of basic concepts. They sound basic, but they're not basic of freedom and equality. So I suggested in the articles a different alternative. I kind of give a, a prism in the article through which to look at these contemporary debates through a different uh, uh, light. And uh, I think the examples I give of um, uh, unity and cross-racial collaborations all shared one thing, uh, had one thing in common. I mean, I gave examples, I don't have time to go into this, but I gave examples, for instance, of uh, Third World Alliances, uh, Pan-Africanism, but also, for instance, the Rainbow Coalition that was uh, initiated and led by Fred Hampton of the Black, pa uh, Black Panther Party. And obviously the, the, the shift and change in the politics of people like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, what they all have in common, sadly, is the fact that they were actually considered to be the most dangerous and, and, um, and riskful uh, for the state. And they were all basically killed one after the other from uh, Ben Barka uh, uh, killed through the collaboration of the French and Moroccan intelligence. He was a leading figure in the Pan-African movement to indeed uh, Fred Hampton. And I wanted to 
close with, a, uh, with uh, an example of uh, this sort of proposition I make about going towards radical kinships by uh, mentioning a film that I think a lot of people have watched now, at least if you have BBC. What I found uh, uh, very interesting in the film Mangrove by Steve McQueen, that is now part of a set of five films, I think that Steve McQueen has come out, has, is bringing out. Um, a lot of people have discussed Mangrove uh, uh, on social media. One of the um, people in the film is a black woman, a black a leader of the black British uh, uh, Black Panther Party. And there is a fantastic scene where she actually goes to Asian workers to convince them uh, to join the union and to convince them to join the Black, Party, Black Panther Party in Britain. And what I thought was so beautiful about this scene, not only because it says a lot about gender politics and she has come to play a very important role in the Black feminist movement in Britain, but also that the Black, Black political power in Britain has provided us with an example, an experience, that we actually rarely, rarely refer to in, in Europe. It's the experiences from the United States that we refer to and rely much of our uh, inspiration from. And what I thought was so beautiful in how Steve McQueen set up this scene was the kind of self-evidence of it, of this young black woman going to talk with this, I don't know, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Indian workers to convince them to join the struggle. And I think it's really important to think about this, what it means that, for instance, conceptions of political blackness that are now being uh, mocked and, and, and critiqued have actually come from black radicals themselves and their understanding of the importance of uniting black Caribbean workers and Asian workers uh, in the UK. So I wanted to close with this example and invite everybody either to watch the film or to go back to that scene to understand that some of the terminologies we are critiquing today as being uh, flattening or dismissive of the particular experiences, for instance, of Black people have actually been the uh, motivated by or um, um, invented by Black radicals themselves. So I wanted to leave it at this. And there are some suggestions I have also for thinking more closely about what it means to be in, engaged with a debate and topic that is so clearly in close proximity between academia and activism. So that's one point of discussion that I wanted to uh, us and invite you to ask me questions or to give me suggestions. What does it mean that actually much of what we are discussing about is produced in the academy rather than in the movements and in, in, the, in the communities? And the other thing that I wanted to also invite you to talk about is to think about how do we do coalition politics and radical transformations without losing sight of our internal hierarchies as well. And I'm saying this also as someone who has done research in Morocco and seeing a very new kind of political engagement among activists around anti-racism. It's a very new experience. It was ne never really strongly part of leftist politics in Morocco, but this has come out in recent years because of the whole migration policies and uh, people from Africa collecting in the northern coastal parts uh, of the continent. So I think we should talk about more productive ways of doing anti-racism within our respective communities, which is not, of course, only uh, uh, about uh, non-Black people of color doing uh, uh, anti-racism against Black people, but also, for instance, how, how do Black uh, communities do this kind of reparative activism, understanding that there is a very strong also susceptibility to Islamophobia on the Black community. So these are sort of more, yeah, practical questions that I think we should deal with as a collective in the discussion rather than me prescribing these uh, solutions. Miriam, I cannot thank you enough for this uh, really inspiring talk, very thought provoking. It is exactly what we needed at this point of this series where we hosted a series of scholars and uh, scholars activists uh, which have illustrated and discussed aspects 
different aspects of uh, the anti-racist struggle and uh, uh, from Kehinde Andrews to um, um, Anandi Ramamutri, which, who was actually here a couple of weeks, two, three weeks ago, precisely bringing to the forum um, the legacy of the internationalism that characterized uh, the British anti-racist movements in, in the 60s and 70s. Um, so it is not only really um, thought provoking and inspiring and insightful, but uh, also very much in, uh, in dialogue with what we have heard in, in past um, seminars. So I want to thank you, you really thank you very much for this. Uh, I have, of course, lots of questions, and Miriam has asked herself the questions also <laughs> at the end of her talk. But I will uh, now um, open it uh, up to the uh, to the audience, to who so anyone who wants to raise um, a question or ask a question can either post it in the chat or, even better, um, raise their hand and we you know unmute themselves. I think so we have one question yeah. um, right at the bottom of the chat. If you scroll to yeah. the bottom, um, there's a question in there for you. Yeah, so yeah, I can see that there is a question. So while, while everyone else is uh, warming up, um, Iris Boss is asking, that was brilliant. What are your thoughts on the new Dutch political party striving to be anti-capitalist? Sorry, the uh, Dutch political party BJ1 striving to be anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, anti-racist and anti-patriarchy? Um, if there are more questions, maybe we can collect a few uh, while people are also thinking about, uh, you know, there is a lot to digest and uh, uh, to think about. I, I would like uh, Miriam um, to ask you something about uh, um, your, um, your, your uh, sort of engagement with Paul Gilroy's work, uh, which I thought was really, of, of course, very important. Um, there are a lot of similarities uh, in your approach to his approach. He came, I mean, he's arguing, as you mentioned, uh, the dissatisfaction with the lack of imagination and the la lack of, an, of, of, of a novel language that can um, take us away from um, skin-based kind of political activism, which reinforces what you call in your article, sort of in Olympics of oppression, or um, takes us away from the inter intersectional kind of dimensions of oppressions that we, um, we share. Um, and um, I was just wondering if you can maybe comment on um, what you think about his notion of strategic universalism or plan planetary humanism, which I thought were interesting. But for example, when I was teaching this, um, his material and these notions, um, I, was, I, I was met with quite a lot of resistance um, from uh, a variety of students who um, couldn't uh, identify with, um, with the possibility of shying away from uh, blackness, so to speak. So I wanted to kind of engage you with, with this um, while we um, wait for others to come up with their own questions. So if you want to start answering these two, that yeah. would be good. Okay, thank you so much and thank you for uh... Uh, your wrap up and uh, I um, think you have a fantastic seminar series. I've uh, joined some of your uh, meetings and some really inspiring and some less inspiring contributions to the debate about race and racism. Uh, I was actually, uh, uh, I think your question about strategic universalism, of course, vis-a-vis -vis strategic essentialism, uh, um, it reminds me of one of your earlier uh, meetings that you also had, I think, with uh, Kehinde Andrews about the uh, logic of political blackness, uh, because I think this is an example of that, right? Tension between being strategic in how you organize and uh, being um, still true to a certain particularity. Um, and I think that the, the, the misunderstanding or the the maybe unnecessary confusion comes from the fact that sometimes uh, they both uh, have completely different goals. So at the beginning of my talk, I said, it's very important to understand, are we talking about something descriptive or is it something analytical? 
Are we talking about something that is in the past and that we are engaging with in our writings and discourses as a reference to the past? Or is it engaging with terms in order to claim it for the present? And I think there's kind of confusion about how these uh, uh, conversations are going uh, that leads to unnecessary tension. So for instance, the idea of a strategic universalism very much relates to methodology. How do you resist? How do we actually combat uh, state power and the way it racializes uh, peoples and creates uh, a kind of uh, myth, a myth about, for instance, in, in, in Paul Giro's work very much uh, clear in, in, in his uh, you no know, black in the union jack and his black atlantic uh, type of uh, work it was about how you fight back it never claims to be about uh how you describe the community of who you are and i think there's a strange recurring confusion in what confusion in what these two variations mean so for instance uh a strategic or a necess necessary essentialism is perfectly fine if we are trying to understand which intersections in terms of Islamophobia play a particular role that is uh, part and parcel of how Islamophobia succeeds. That is a kind of specificity that is required. Um, if it is about a representation of particular histories of uh, black communities, then you need a certain specific uh, analogy. And you shouldn't just um, ignore that there are specific experiences and histories. But the history of, as I said, uh, that scene in the film of McQueen in Mangrove, it shows you very clearly, it is really about this very pragmatic understanding and realization we're actually too small. All of us in our separate entities, we're never going to be able to counter state power or fight back. We need to find a strategic way that brings us together. For them, at that time, for instance, the term blackness was very useful not because it was sugarcoating all the differences between groups or anti-blackness among Asian communities, but far more specific. And this is why I think it's so important to recover and repatriate in a way these older legacies that are now sort of forgotten. Uh, for instance, the work of the woman I mentioned, uh, Althea Jones and Darkus Howie, in setting up the Black uh, uh, British Panther Party, they come themselves, they came from Trinidad. They come from a tradition in the West Indies that was trying to organize the what they called uh, former intended groups and former slave groups, so Asian and Black Trinidadians into labor forces and, and union resistance. It's something, ironically, that was important, imported from the West Indies into Britain with these new migrants, among whom also were students and intellectuals, and tried to be manifested on the ground in a new context. It was a methodology, a strategy to fight back. And maybe we have to find a way to navigate these multiple interpretations much more clearly to say, look, some terminologies actually have nothing to do with identity, with culture. They have only to do with how we organize and fight. But I want to add to that, that there's something more, there is something in addition about this strategic universalism when it comes to a method of fighting back that actually provides the solutions also to um, prevent or to limit uh, internal differences and existing xenophobia. My argument is that it is precisely in the site of struggle 
in us coming together in our differences that we actually create these human relations that become loyalties or kinships that allow us then to bring a new, a better, a more progressive understanding of the other into our own communities. And I'm not just saying this thinking and dreaming out loud. I'm saying this because our histories, our radical histories have proven that that's how it works. That when you see, for instance, in a small window at least of, of, of what we had in the Netherlands that is completely invisible now in the 60s and 70s when we had Moroccans and Turks and Moluccans and Indonesians and Surinamese and Antillians coming together and working together. It was the birth of actually connections between these communities. And you see it now again, a new generation of activists that are exposed through discussions about, for instance, the anti-blackness of Black Pete, of that very racist figure. It is because these Palestinian, uh, Moroccan, uh, uh, Somalian, I mean, there's a new generation also from the 90s, Somali, other refugee communities that are now second generation. They come together in these movements, for instance, against the war in Iraq or against uh, suppression of Palestinians. They meet, they strike alliances, and they learn all these new things and bring them with them in their communities. So resistance is not just something it's nice, but in it is also the solution to, do, to undo these internal differences. I can't hear you. I was just thanking you for a very important answer. I think you, you, you raised a really important point about differentiating between uh, the language of the struggle and the identifications that can be multifarious and uh, more complex that cannot be really encompassed in a, in a, in a word or in a, or, or in a language. Uh, I wanted also to bring the questions to you, other questions that have been appearing on the chat. Uh, from Scarlett Harris, who says, thanks uh, for a brilliant talk. To what extent do you think that the trends you talk about are linked to the commodification of anti-racism? I'm thinking about the incredible pro proliferation and interest in books about anti-racism, most often focusing on the individual in the wake of uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, I'll read out um, the other two so you can maybe engage with all three questions together. Um, uh, Khalil Hamid, thanks for your work. The same scene from Mangrove follows the woman from the Black Panthers party going to use the bathroom after speaking with the Punjabi man in the living room. And she goes into the kitchen where there are about six Asian women with each other. Could you comment also on gender and migration and the complex contradictory ways it articulates in this tradition methodology? And the third question is from William Frey. Thank you for your talk. In the United States, there has been um, quick co-optation and institutionalization of terminology like anti-racism by companies and uh, universities. With this widespread co-optation and institutionalization, how does this complicate the arguments you're making around reviving radical theorizing and conceptualizing? And as a PhD student myself, the role of people who find themselves within these institutions. Um, there is another fourth um, question, but I'm, I'm happy to stop here and give you the floor again later. Uh, there is already enough, I guess, for you to engage with. Yes, and do uh, stop me if I go on too long in answering the questions, because I don't know how many... Uh... Exactly, um, I'm going to raise my hand. Yes, <laughs> I th uh, th that's a, um, that scene in the film, I thought that was brilliant, but I think I don't know. I'm not a film critic. I'm not a cultural studies person. But I think Steve McQueen was trying to tell us something by following her uh, meeting with the, uh, uh, the man uh, through a scene where she goes through the kitchen to the bathroom. I think uh, he was hinting at these are actually all unfinished projects. You start with something and you want to bring something together, but that's of course not the end. There are all these different layers of radical uh, politics that include different modalities of identities. And I think it's not a surprise in a way that uh, um, 
uh, Althea Jones became a very prominent figure in actually the uh, black feminist movement. I think I felt like that scene was in a way honoring her. Like it was kind of, she saw what was happening. She smiled at them. She goes into the bathroom, comes out. And I think the film is also trying to tell us she already knew then that what she was trying to do with this very sort of general level of the workers, bringing them together, that that was a very hard one, but the beginning that it's completely uh, open to uh, um, uh, more layers uh, of radical connections. And that's why she was so important because she had so much critique also. I really invite people to, to read her work. She, has, she was very principled in her critique also of the black radical uh, movement in its, uh, in its gender politics. Um, and I think that for us, it's also a, a lesson for today where we also need to acknowledge that we think we have maybe all the answers because we are so far ahead of what happened in the 60s or 70s, but we also have a lot of issues that we still have to deal with. And as you personally, I think, uh, know from conversations we've had, I think, for instance, that it is one thing to employ and to uh, write intersectionality behind everything, but I, for instance, see very little intersectionality when it comes to acknowledging and taking serious disability in our activist movements. So I think there will be a time in 10 or 20 years when we are watching, uh, people are watching films made about the radical movements of our era where, with, where we look back and say, wow, that is quite an ableist representation of what radical politics was, et cetera, uh, et cetera. So I think it's a, it's a beautiful scene that is trying to sort of hint us at uh, the unfinished business of radical politics. And this is in part related to the question about modification. Commodification does different things. Obviously, it does co-optation. It does, uh, um, it depoliticizes. And what, one of the outcomes of that is that it actually provides us with a kind of liminal understanding of politics that is very boundary driven. It's only this case or this cause that we're going to be fighting for. And that's it. It sort of closes off the possibility of a radical imagination that transforms and that transgresses. Or let me say, in, in the words uh, um, uh, of other critics, uh, where, for instance, identity politics becomes incorporated, while actually for radical politics, identity is only the starting point. It's a good way to start your politics, but it's a terrible way to end it also there. The whole point is to transform and to transgress into other forms of struggle. That is what commodification also does not allow you to do, whether it's because of the aesthetics of it and how it's sort of confining it into particular themes or whether it's the, uh, the depoliticization of the, of the terminology. I am very, I'm very flabbergasted, you could say, in how quick uh, the state and capital have understood uh, in these recent years that there is a growing angry undercurrent among the commons, among the people, that the uh, uh, anger and uh, the level of struggle, sometimes uh, it bleeps up and then it, it recedes. It's not a permanent level of struggle, unfortunately, but when it comes up, it's very angry. And I think uh, uh, sort of the ruling class or the states, they understand they need to really uh, co-opt part of that, otherwise it's going to blow up in their faces. And I think, I'm, as I said, I'm very flabbergasted to see how smoothly and easy Black Lives Matter has been incorporated in some of these sort of corporate and state. I mean, it's almost laughable to hear uh, politicians who are at the forefront of racist politics and racist discourse, all one after the other come out with statements in support of Black Lives Matter. The contradiction has never been this ridiculous uh, almost. And I think, that has been a very interesting example of how one way to de-radicalize a certain type of anti-racism is to incorporate and co-opt it. Uh, it's not just corporations and the state. I really think there is a specific 
uh, angle in how the academy and race also intersects uh, uh, in this. And one of that, uh, uh, one of the expressions thereof, I think is those books that one of the people uh, asked in the chat. Um, I forgot the name of the person who asked, but I think the production of these handbooks of guides, sort of hand guides, how to be a good anti-racist that are very much invested in this liberal understanding that is already co-opted of anti-racism through privilege theory. So hand guides and books that tell you how to acknowledge, how to be aware, et cetera, et cetera, that are then sold uh, uh, massively. I think that's a really good example of how this co-optation work. And mind you, most of them are white authors. Miriam, I don't want to stop you because we would uh, want to listen for you to, to this um, reflection for, for longer, really interesting points that you've raised, but there are so many questions in the chat it's and so very long good. ones. <laughs> so I want everyone to have an opportunity to ask you and receive an answer. Um, so we have Victoria, uh, who's a PhD student uh, working on decolonizing, who asks, it would be interesting if, if uh, you could try and trace where and why of this backlash against uh, political blackness and what sparked it. We have Shabhaz, I hope I pronounce it rightly, Ulla, who was, says, um, hi, that was a very brilliant lecture. I'm trying to find where I run. What do you think of the idea that discourse on anti-racism is creating a gap between those in power to create a change and those seeking the change by creating dichotomies and tensions in the form of painting the two sides as opposing fr fractions, which in turn progresses marginalization and recycles the same systematic racism in itself. Um, so basically the question is um, uh, about, I'm trying to show, cut it a little bit. Um, so discourse as argued by Escobar has just managed to repackage ideals and systematic distribution of power in the context of the 21st century. This is an essay more than a question, but very interesting one. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question um, by Tina, Tina Wallace, who says, great analysis and so encouraging. I'm very concerned about the ignoring of your UK history of racism, colonialism and anti-racism and anti-imperialism. There is a reliance on USA literature currently in the UK, and there is so much learning and experience we are losing by ignoring um, this history. Uh, we have finally um, Alexandra Oanka, um, who says, thank you for the great presentation, Miriam. The centrality of the concept of white privilege in analyzing or in analysis of anti-racism can also end up by recentering whiteness and the experiences of white people. So my question would be about the politics of knowledge production in movements. Is this due to epistemic difference and applying standpoint epistemology as a way of deference to others which are essentialized? When people of color activists defer to essentialized others, it might insulate them also from criticism, but also from connection across difference. I'm thinking with a recent wonderful essay by Olofeni Taiko on elite capture and epistemic deference. Um, well, there are many more, so I'll, maybe I'll leave you with, uh, with these three for now. And I think we will uh, probably have time for another three after your response, okay. uh, which will be, so we, we already have another three lined up. Yeah. If you could maybe answer <clears throat> these long and complex questions, um, keeping keeping um, in mind that there are others, that would be really great. Thank you, Miriam. Yeah, it's, it's, it's always like this. We should always calculate that in the beginning, it seems like there's not many questions and we elaborate in our answers and then we get stuck in the end. But uh, this means really... we, ha we have to invite you another three times. Yes, <laughs> no problem, hereby. Um, yeah, thank you. I mean, of course, apologies in advance. I won't be able to answer all these questions, uh, but I will try to bring some together. I realized also I forgot the question about by Ayn, uh, by uh, one of your earlier questioners. I think that's really interesting also to see changes in the political domains uh, around sort of parliamentary politics. I mean, it's, you know, the break breaking away from mainstream leftist or reformist parties precisely from a need to organize people of color that uh, uh, comes from also a need to center anti-racism 
without excluding anti-capitalism and state policies is exemplified by the emergence of this new political party in the Netherlands, Bayern, that was led by a, uh, that is led by a black woman and that has managed to uh, um, uh, include and recruit a really interesting amalgam of, of, of uh, politicians and peoples uh, from the LGBT community, uh, from uh, um, immigrant community and also very clear sort of anti-racist and anti-capitalist formation. So I think it's a very encouraging development, I would say, uh, which is still very much in the beginning, but I think it's very encouraging because not only uh, purely from the idea of changing the parliamentary uh, uh, field, I think it's very hard to do that with a small new party, but what he did do is actually on the level of imagination, break away from the idea that we are doomed with the type of parties or the dualities between conservative and, 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 uh, and reformist uh, on the one hand, or that we are doomed to only rely on the existing political uh, uh, recipes uh, on offer. It kind of opens up the possibility to organize and to do different things. So I think Historically, I would say that's already an amazing contribution from these new political parties. And I think it's not just in Holland, it's in different countries where we see this kind of breaking away from the kind of old mainstream reformist type of doing politics and providing new alternative that is in essence and by default already uh, uh, diverse. I wish we had that also in the UK because I think that, you know, Jeremy Corbyn should have just broken away from the Labour Party and reformed in a new uh, composition because there's so much need and hunger and possibility to do that. Um, so I think that what it also is showing by Ayn is that the ideas and discussions in theory that sort of are um, this backlash against political blackness, in reality, we see a different dynamic. We see in reality, actually people coming together across different ethnic groups and, and political causes. Uh, they come actually together in new formations that are maybe not termed political blackness, but they are very clearly examples of coalition politics. So I think it's really interesting also in relation to the question someone else asked about uh, the, uh, the difference between scholarship around white privilege and, you know, uh, I, I don't know if that person uh, counterposed the scholarship against uh, of whiteness and, uh, and activism uh, around whiteness, but I think what it also shows is that uh, there is a, a quite a discrepancy between what is happening in the theoretical bubbles in our debate and analysis, even the essays written by, for instance, big names uh, like Wilderson or others, and what is happening on the ground and in the neighborhoods in reality. I think that that discrepancy needs to be uh, closed uh, and, 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 and it shows in any case a different uh, reality. But uh, we, it's not um, guaranteed that the reality being less uh, um, uh, fragmented or the realities being uh, less cynical, uh, that they are also going to be those uh, realities that are remembered. That was my whole point about the fact that in these radical legacies, there is a very interesting selective mechanism going on in what is being salvaged and what is being reproduced and remembered. And therefore my question, my answer to the question of uh, the ignoring of the history of anti-racism in the UK and the uh, 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 um, en enlarging or inflating of uh, the history uh, and guidelines from the US is really interesting be because I think even the legacies and the knowledge produced from the US is selective. You see what I mean? It's actually not a representative uh, uh, set of ideas and, and propositions that we are getting from the US either. The US also has a very different radical uh, uh, a legacy that is at all, uh, not at all part of the sort of uh, comprehensive, almost ready-made uh, package of ideas we uh, think is coming from the US. And I think that's really important. And there's a very interesting discussion, I think, by uh, 
Robin Kelly and Fred Moten uh, about also these different histories of the emergence of black studies and ethnic studies in the US, showing that there is actually a history behind that that was very much about indeed bringing together of indigenous politics, immigrant politics, and black African American politics that is actually forgotten. So not only do we preference uh, certain uh, 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 Western um, knowledge productions that are uh, in, 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 in one place and not in the other, uh, also that which we preference is itself a biased uh, representation. I, I think that's very important, but I do agree that uh, sometimes uh, it's you have a choice as activists in, uh, in Europe, you have so many choices, your own history, that is already erased in wherever country you are that is full of rebellious and transgressive uh, examples. But also your international inspiration, you can choose, why would you uh, preference a, a US focus uh, that is more uh, inclined now to be connected to Afro-pessimism rather than a UK focus that is far more embedded in these unities because these people, as I said, from the West Indies also brought with them these unified approaches. Who told you that you only have uh, that one uh, option? We have these choices. And the problem is that we need to be more open about our motive, why we preference certain uh, ideologies and certain theories. My very simple answer is I will prefer what is the most radical. I will prefer and center that which is the most useful, radical, and progressive. And if that fits with an idea of unity and race and class, that is, for instance, embedded within the history of the Birmingham School in the UK, Stuart Hall, Paul Gero, or Stephen Andan and his race and class project, then that is the one that I would like to build upon uh, more than I would want to build upon, for instance, ideas uh, around social death uh, that have to do with a very American experience of marginalization and racialization. So we have the choice. Uh, Miriam. Thank you so much. Um, so we have um, a question that uh, brings back the issue of political blackness, uh, which was raised also by one of the other um, attendees. So maybe you can engage with that. And the question is around um, by Hasna uh, Ankal. Um, uh -huh. Thanks for the interesting talk. I can't find the option. Oh, sorry, but that's not part of the question. Resisting the term political blackness is understandable today but now there seems to be a trend to go against the term people of color as well. So I see a good opportunity to show easily how this is part of a conscious attempt to make collaborations difficult. And what do you think? So maybe you can answer this uh, and maybe engage with the question of, you know, it seems yeah. that the notion of political blackness is also criticized for being sort of a national as again, mm. sort of a more progressive, globalized, transnational yes. 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 Uh, approach. Um, but the national was actually very international to start with, <laughs> as you suggested, and we heard in previous talks here. So yes. this is interesting too. We also have a question by Liam um, Srivastava. Uh, would agree there is a com complete lack of knowledge of UK anti-racist struggle and theory. Sorry, this is actually not a question, but um, um, sharing resources. I really like how in our seminars, the chat has become an opportunity to sort of share knowledges and, and sort of an online archive of materials. And I really, I really think this is great. Um, and also the fact that there are lots of people who have given presentations themselves who come back to listen to others. So we've managed to, to at least create a sort of a, an online community of um, scholars here. Um, yeah, I guess um, I'm Corny, um, another PhD student in the department, uh, would like to ask you something about, again, bringing you back to the Dutch situation. And uh, uh, his question is around the Zwarte Peer debate, which has sparked a long overdue reckoning with racism in the Netherlands, but also a lot of backlash. And where do you see the Dutch discourse on race, color, blindness, and tolerance going, um, especially with regard to Islamophobia? I think these are. I would say our, our last um, questions. And if, um, as we know, we, we were going to uh, close today a bit earlier. Um, I, I'd really like you to address the question of political blackness uh, because and, 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 and of um, the question around um, people of color and the denominations and 
um, the idea that this is also something that um, somehow uh, compounds our intersectional approach um, because I think it's something that a lot of us are grappling with and really value your opinion as yeah. well as the last question. Thank I'll, you. I'll, uh, I'll do my best. Uh, I, I do think you uh, it's, it's true. I think you should aggregate your chats and uh, turn them into an archive because I think over the weeks uh, there have been uh, amazing suggestions that I have partly also help to solve the, the missing link I'm talking about in, in what is being uh, reproduced and remembered and what is not. And it's very hard to find through the maze of uh, you know, publications and what have you. So I think that's really uh, uh, great. I think um, it's interesting also for me, if I may make a meta observation, it's interesting how often the question of political blackness comes back. There's certainly, a concern or a discomfort about political blackness, either as a term or as um, or um, a discomfort to reject it uh, from this from the uh, from the side of not wanting to reject coalition politics, and on the one hand, a discomfort uh, to promote it from a fear to not be seen as someone who does flattening of anti-racism and racial communities and ignores the internal differences. I think on the one hand, we need to answer that by saying, look, it's about a method. It's not about uh, a, 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 a representational political uh, identification. It's not about, Steve Anandan said it back in the 70s and 80s, it was never about skin color. It was about political color, and that's why it was called political blackness. In honor of that tradition of whether it's Howie or uh, Stephen Andan, where it was so clearly about a method for struggle and for resistance and not an academic exercise in discourse analysis and how it represents communities or doesn't, in honor of that, I think it's important to not mock the way people use political blackness. I mean, I have been mocked, even though I don't use it, because my critique of the kind of liberal or, or yeah, um, not that internationalist form of anti-racism is automatically decoded as uh, political blackness, even though I never use that term in my own writing, and you can see it in my article, I actually don't use it. But it has been mockingly referred to, you, to as you know, team political blackness. So I think just for the sake of, of honoring the legacy of people who have against all odds tried to organize against state violence, against internal racisms and xenophobia in our communities, it's not easy. A lot of Asian people in the UK were, for instance, not that happy with being called black. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was also very much a transgressive, experience. So on the one hand, we have that legacy that has to do with a method of resistance that we need to acknowledge and honor. On the other hand, we need to be open for change. Terms change all the time. Uh, the reference change all the time. And in all honesty, I don't think political blackness is at all a dominant term within the movement. It's very much an academic debate. It's very much a debate between certain scholars uh, who are also looking for a particular niche with which they can create straw mans to provide an alternative reading. I personally hardly see it and read it uh, in the movement. So the good news is it's not even that big of an issue in, uh, in, in reality. But I have to say there is another reason why there is a kind of uh, para paralysis around political uh, blackness, and it's very much to do with what we discussed before about the type of anti-racism that is being commodified. There is a certain type of racism and racialization that is commodified, that is far more lenient to specific subjective identities and, and fragmenting these groups according to specificities and not a kind of racism and anti-racism uh, that we see being commodified that has to do with uh, solidarity and united uh, forces. And I think that's why there is a quite, I think, intriguing white enabling of 
the critiquing of political blackness because actually in the dynamic on the ground what you see is i'm actually struck also by the confidence of a lot of white uh, academics and activists in, in emerging themselves in the debate and for instance critiquing what they see as people of color uh, and defense of uh, black people and mocking in that process political blackness. I, I find that quite intriguing how, how, how this kind of white enabling is also part of the critique of uh, political uh, blackness. So it is part of an incremental change of the way certain terminologies refer to certain types of anti-racist uh, politics. And I think it's a dead end. I think uh, one of the core reasons why I critiqued white privilege is precisely because I saw this incremental progressive reactionary change from black to brown to white and reverse from white to brown to black. Not only is it a dead end because when we're done with critiquing political blackness, which actually is not a real thing, we are going to political, uh, sorry, people of color, like Hasna just mentioned. Hasna uh, just mentioned something important. For me, it highlights uh, there's a new stage now, people of color. The next, uh, after we've done with critiquing and erasing people of color, we will go to something else that is less specific into more and more specific denominations. I think it's a dead end. It's not gonna help us in the method of how we do uh, resistance. And I think, uh, I hope that uh, Hasna's piece on, Hasna wrote a brilliant piece about um, the, the term Afro. Afro is one of those terms that have come into the movement that is also quite fascinatingly being adopted by certain people of color, precisely because it offers them an entry point into a type of uh, black politics that they would otherwise not have had. And so she has now writes about how the term Afro has now also been uh, appropriated by certain Moroccans, which is hilarious, knowing what the etymology of Afro means and how it is a reference to a kind of objective reference to Africa that comes from the reality of African Americans in the, in the, in the US. And so she writes about why would I be an Afro-Moroccan as a Black Moroccan? I am already African. What is this adjective about? And that adjective for me is also about trying to enter a certain space of doing politics that is more welcoming to the kind of, as I said, anti-political blackness and more sort of essentialist type of doing anti-racism. So I think it's a dead end. And, and that's why I think it's important for us to talk back and to speak back and to bring back these critiques that we are uh, now discussing so that we can maybe pause and halt this incremental change and take out the valuable critique. Indeed, there is valuability critique, but not to throw away the baby with the bathwater. And that's, I think, part of what we're uh, sitting and doing here as well. I'm sorry I didn't really get into the, uh, the other uh, questions, but it's just maybe a sign that we need to organize uh, more of this uh, and, and, and return to some of the questions. Yeah, Miriam, thank you so much for uh, um, not only the talk itself, but uh, the Q&A. You, you inspired us even more with uh, very important reflections and points to, to take home and think about. Obviously, together with you, we will invite Hashna too, because yes. we want to hear more about her work. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Um, it sounds like really important to also detect and uh, represent and uh, bring into the conversations experiences of um, race dynamics or, or racializations that happen beyond the Anglo-American context, like the one you just mentioned. So I think this is really great and important uh, if you underline this. Uh, thank you to everyone who um, joined us. Um, I really think this was one of the most passionate and uh, uh, really uh, taking us to the core of some of the issues that are really preoccupying us every day as we mobilize, not only as we study, but as we mobilize as activists or public intellectuals, as you said. So you offered us really, really important food for thought. Um, and we want to thank you uh, very much for this. We hope to see you in the next <laughs> talks as a guest. Uh, and. Um, um, we would like to just um, keep you for another minute to announce the next uh, um, seminar next week, which will be 
Uh, our um, speaker will be Pro Professor Sandro Mezzaltra from the University of Bologna, who will uh, talk about the criminalization of um, humanitarian rescue at sea. He's a professor of political, political theory and critical border studies, but also one of the founder of Mediterranea, um, the rescuing uh, humanitarian um, boat that um, rescues uh, asylum seekers trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea. Um, so um, this promises to be another really important, interesting uh, talk. I want also to take this opportunity to announce that the last talk that if for those of you who have um, seen the poster that was circulating early on in the term, uh, we had envisaged um, Professor Hassan Haj um, give a talk uh, on the 18th of December, but uh, this talk has been postponed. So it will happen at the beginning of the new year. So the final seminar will happen with, um, on the 9th with the talk of uh, Sandro Mezzadra. Thank you very much. And thanks, Kim, who might want to yes. also add a couple of words for, um, yeah, to share some of the <laughs> technical and uh, uh, event bright logistical information that are always appearing in our email. So if there is any yeah. new information that you want to share. So I've put into the chat the Eventbrite um, link for the next event. Um, we already have quite a few registrations. So some of you may have already registered for that session um, already. We've had it open for about a week now, but there's still um, plenty of spaces on that. So do feel free to go to that link that's in the chat, but I'll also be sending it round um, via email to you all uh, with the recording from this session as well. Um, and thank you very much, uh, Miriam, uh, for a great talk and also um, for uh, commenting on, and I think also Ruby, you touched on it, on all of the different ways in which um, everybody attending is adding into the chat and adding into the discussion. Um, and maybe what we will do um, at the end of the seminar series is revisit all of the recordings because we have not only the recordings of the video and the audio, but we also have the recordings of all the um, chats. So what we can do is, is possibly look over all of them and where we see that people have put in various different resources, we can put it onto the Facebook page for our Centre for Migration and Diaspora and possibly just link through to which different talks um, people had various different resources for. Though I'm sure that we will find actually across a number of them that they, they appear multiple times. Um, but I think that's really helpful. And I, I think that's a really interesting thing. And I would definitely... Um, again uh, ask if you all want to do that in the following uh, sessions that we run both in the remainder of this seminar series but also in the others because I think you know having those resources there's lots of, um, of, of books uh, that we use quite often and that might end up being you know our you know our go-to um, mm. but I think it is part and parcel of looking forward and seeing what new um, resources are coming up uh, what's being kind of mentioned now and what kind of um, resources we can look at. So definitely keep those coming and we'll look at ways in which we can incorporate that into both a review of this seminar series that we've done and also move forward to um, the next seminar series that we run as well. Um, again, I think it's worked better this time. So thank you all for of those of you who've attended our sessions before. And we do realize there's been a few different issues in terms of logging in. I think today's login process worked a bit better where I just send you out a, a clearer email than maybe the event, right? So I will do that again uh, for, the, for the following sessions as well. Um, but we, I will try and get the recordings out as quickly as possible. And you'll get a double recording this week if you also signed up to last week's because I, I have just got that recording through today. <laughs> <laughs> Buy one, get home two. <laughs> yeah, thank you both. And thank you also for doing this in a time of uh, online teaching and uh, digital communication that is uh, making us uh, even more exhausted and uh, sometimes uh, just a little bit crazy. So I think this is really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam, again. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.